Okay. Do not do anything. I was going to say do not do anything, but you probably drove your families here and they're expecting you to drive them back home. So. <laughs> um, but no, we, we, we are grateful to all of our men. Fathers, father figures, thank you all. God bless you. We have a gift we'd like to present to you, but that'll be at the end of the service on your way out. Very, very special, small, small token of our appreciation. Hopefully, every time you use this gift, you look at this gift, you'll be reminded that we are praying for you and that we believe in you tremendously. You know, in a day and time where uh, we are seeing the enemy through the, the actions within our culture trying to just bring men down, trying to downplay the role of men, I am so grateful that God has a remnant who are standing in the gap and are representing what men should be. And I thank every one of you for that. Once again, can we give a hand of applause for all of the men this morning? God bless you all. And Pastor Steve, thank you for leading us in prayer for all of the men. I want to quickly, again, just acknowledge our Branch Forest campus. Church family, would you help me welcome our Branch Forest family this morning as they join us? God bless you all over there. Thank you so much for all that you, God is doing. We thank God for all that he's doing in your lives, and thank you for being in the house of the Lord this morning. I want to invite you, if you will, today, don't join in your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to be reading from verse 27 to verse 31 this morning. We, if I want to use flying or airplane or air travel analogy, we are, or we are the cruising point of our series, United We Build. Uh, we've been talking about uh, the role that God has for you and I in his transformative work. As I've mentioned over the last several weeks, I want to again say, God is working, and he desires for you and I to be involved in what he is doing. God doesn't want us to be on the sidelines. He doesn't want us to be passive spectators. He wants us to be active participants of what he is doing. And what I love about God is this, that he won't force you and I to engage with him. He invites us, and he shows us the value of aligning ourselves with him, aligning ourselves with his purpose, with his plan, and trusting that, that what we could never do on our own, that God can do in us and more. And I just want to encourage you to join with me in just seeking the Lord wholeheartedly and let it be your heart's cry today and every day that, God, I want you to use me because I truly believe that you have, called, you have a place to call in upon my life. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse, beginning with verse 27 through verse 31, um, we're going to read, uh, I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Bible Translation. Um, I want to invite you to please stand with me to honor the reading of God's word this morning. And we're going to pray in just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 27, Paul writes, Now you are Christ's body and individually parts of it. And God has appointed, everybody say appointed. God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, and various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? Verse 31, but earnestly desire the greater gifts, and yet I am going to show you a far better way. Pray with me this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you. As always, we are so grateful to you for your word. God, we echo the words of the psalmist who declared with confidence in his heart, as we do so today, God, your word have I hidden in my heart that I am not sin against you. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word that points the way for us to walk so that, God, our lives are aligned with your purpose and your plan. God, thank you for not leaving it up to ourselves to figure out how to walk with you or how to pursue the life you desire for us to. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, who is that constant teacher and encourager and instructor, Father, helping us, Lord, to not only understand your heart, but to be able to walk in your will. And so, God, I pray as I share what you've laid on my heart for your body this morning, that, God, you would speak through me today. God, I would decrease, and that, God, you would increase today, and that, God, your word would not return void unto you, but, God, would accomplish the purpose for which it is spoken, so that when we all leave this place today, God, we are challenged, motivated, encouraged to do our part in the work that you are doing. We give you glory and we give you praise, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated this morning. As I mentioned, we are continuing a series titled United We Build, in which we are talking about how we find our place in God's transformative work. And just as a quick recap, 
I want to remind you of some of the things we've talked about over the last several weeks. Week one, which was about a couple of weeks ago, we said that God's will is for every believer, every one of us who are called by his name, to be actively engaged in the life and mission of the local church. When Jesus gave the commandment or his mandate to the disciples in Matthew 28, 19, he said, you are to go into all the world and you are to make disciples. He wasn't only speaking to those individuals. He wasn't only speaking to the crowd of people that may have been around him at the time he spoke those words. He was speaking to every believer. And throughout the generations that have come and gone to our very time, and if the Lord tarries, if our generation comes and goes, and another generation comes in our place, and the Lord hasn't yet returned for his church, the same mandate that applied then, that applies today, will apply in the future. Because we are called to build disciples. We are called to make disciples. We are called to reach others, bring the good news of what Jesus has done, God's provision for addressing man's issue, man's struggle with sin, so that everyone can have an opportunity to hear um, and to be able to accept him. The Bible says that it is not God's will that any perish. And that word any means any. Nobody. It doesn't matter what their story is, their background is, the decisions and choices that they've made. God's desire is that no one perish. Again, he gives us opportunity to choose him, but he wants us to make sure that everyone has that opportunity. That's one of the reasons why missions is so important. That's why, we, that's why we invest as a church in our missionaries, because we know that we can't go to every part of the globe. But God has called men and women who are answering the call every single day to say, yes, Lord, here I am, use me. And they're going, and they're serving, and they're ministering, many times even at the cost of their own lives, but they're willing to do so because they believe in this gospel that has changed every one of our lives. So again, it's this idea that God wants you and I to be involved in what he is doing through his local church. We are not called to be spectators, brothers and sisters. I really hope that you would not settle by just simply coming for an experience, but that you see yourself as a part of Christ's body. And in the same way that every part of a human body contributes to the whole, that you recognize that you have something to contribute to what God is doing in the local church. In week number two, we learned that God has given every believer the capacity to make a significant contribution to the local church's impact. In other words, you have the ability, God-given, to make a difference. It is very easy for you to look at your own talents, your own gifts, and compare yourself to another and think, well, I can't sing like so-and-so. I'm not as gifted as so-and-so. I'm not as eloquent as so-and-so. And think to yourself, well, God can't really use me. The reality is, is God has called you and he wants to use you. And there is something that you and I can contribute to what he is doing. So never, ever, ever think that what you contribute to what God is seeking to do through you is insignificant. God has given you the capacity to make great impact for his kingdom. Today I want to talk to you about the importance of finding your fit in ministry. Everybody say, find your fit. Now, of course, when you hear the word fit, we tend to think of trying to uh, get into a brand new shoe. Um, here's... I used to have a problem. Whenever I would go to the store, I would pick out a shoe from the, the, shoe, the, sh the shelf in the shoe store. This is when Payless used to still be around. They no longer exist. Um, and I would literally take the shoe out of the shoe box, and I would look at it, and then I would take it and put it in the box, and I would go to the counter. And I think one or two times, the workers would ask me, you're not going to try it on? Eh, I don't need to. I should have. Because when I got home and it was time for me to wear those shoes, they didn't fit. I couldn't, I couldn't get my foot in the shoe because it was not the right fit. And all it took was for me to take that extra second, well, not a second, but extra minute to test the shoe to make sure that the shoe fit. Before I bought the shoe, drove home, waited to the day I needed to wear the shoe, and I can't wear it. When we talk about fit, we're talking about finding your place or finding where you belong or where you are meant to flourish, where you are meant to thrive. Um, you know, not every shoe that we see on the counter is going to fit. That's why we have to take it. We have to try it out, right? Not every dress on the rack is going to fit. Just because you look at it, it may look good on the rack. doesn't mean it's going to fit you. You need to try it on first, right? So there's this idea of wanting to find our fit. And if it's important for us to find our fit when it comes to the shoes we wear, the clothes we wear, or any of the things that we do in life, how much more when it comes to the role that God has for us in the local church? God wants you and I to find our fit. 
And the concept of finding our fit refers to how or discovering how God has shaped you and I for ministry. How God has equipped you and I for ministry. And again, it's not this idea that, well, because God may have shaped a person different for ministry or from another person, that this one person is more important than the other. No, it just means that you have your own role that God has for you. You have your own role that God has for you. The question is, are you doing what God has designed you to do? Or are you trying to do what somebody else is doing because you're attracted to the limelight or the, 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 the notoriety or the popularity that they gain because of the gift that you're serving in? We're talking about finding our fit this morning. And I believe with all my heart that God has called every believer to function in a way that unites us around his purpose. There's, a, there's an image I want you to see. It's an image of two people who are holding puzzle pieces. How many of you like playing puzzles? Not a lot of hands. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Well, let's just pretend that we all love playing puzzles, all right? Um, now, one of the things about playing puzzles is this. It, it requires patience. If you're the kind of person that takes out a puzzle piece, especially if it's one of those 50, 100 pieces, and you're thinking you can get it knocked out in five minutes, <laughs> you're wasting your time. Because it takes time to put a puzzle piece together. And you, you don't determine where each puzzle piece goes, right? You have to figure out where it's supposed to go. And just because a particular puzzle piece does not fit in a corner does not mean that you find your way to shove it in that corner and force it to stay in that corner because at the end of the day, the picture is not going to look like it's supposed to look. You discover where it belongs and you put it where it belongs because when that puzzle piece is where it belongs, then the picture is complete. Imagine all of us represent puzzle pieces of the local church. Again, it's not the idea that, well, I think I belong in the corner. And we try to force ourselves to fit in that corner when we were not created for the corner. We were created to be at a different point in the picture. When we discover what our piece is, friends, there's nothing, like I said, over the course of the series that you and I cannot accomplish. And I want to quickly share with you, as, I, as I've had an opportunity to prepare today's message, but then to reflect on my own journey through ministry, whether it was vocational ministry or whether it was serving in ministry as a volunteer, when ministry fits, or when you find your fit in ministry, there are three things that I believe will happen. And if you are like me, you would say, Pastor John, I have found my fit. I, I, I believe I've found my calling. I believe that I've found the place in the road and the assignment that God has for me. And, and it's something that I enjoy, it's something that I flourish in. Then you're going to understand where I'm coming from. But, but for those who have not yet found your fit, it's, all is not lost. It is not too late. God has a role for you, and I believe that the reason that you're here this morning to hear today's message, whether you're here in person at Branch Forest, you're watching online as well, is so that you can also be challenged to want to discover, God, where is my fit here? So that I can do what you've created me and called me to do. When you and I were growing up, one of the things, at least I remember, you know, as a kid, having to play with is these toys that were shaped in diff had different shapes, Right? In fact, sometimes if you go to the, the, the doctor's office, you know, for those of you that have children, you know, whenever I would take the kids to the doctor's office, I, you know, I find myself playing with the toys in the doctor's office while I'm waiting for the doctor to show up. And one, one or two times my kids would tell me, that that's not for you. <laughs> it's like, nobody cares. <laughs> it's sitting there. It needs to be played. I'm going to play it. Um, and one of the toys would, you know, would be some of the, it's pictured in the screen, you know, these, these shapes, right, that are supposed to go in certain slots. And, and again, the idea is that you take each shape, you identify what, it's, what, what the appropriate shape is, and you, what do you do? You drop it in the slot, correct? Um, you, don't, you don't take a square, you see a round hole, and think, oh, no, I, I think I can make it work. And you start to shove it in. You're probably going to get escorted out of the doctor's office because you're destroying the property, right? Um, but it's this idea that we identify what's supposed to fit, and we put it in its proper place. Yes? When ministry fits, here are three things that I believe happens, and I hope would motivate you to want to find your ministry fit. First thing, when ministry fits, is that we see every assignment as an invitation for Christ to work through our lives. I, I told you last week about the opportunity I had when I, you know, when I was allowed to teach or encouraged to teach our second grade boys many, many years ago in Sunday school, and wondering, worrying about whether or not I had what it took to be able to make a difference in those young people's lives. But can I tell you that one of the things that kept me coming back over and over, even though there were some days where I wanted to pull at the time I had hair, what little hair I had, 
But one of the things that kept, kept that, that motivated me to keep coming back was recognizing that even in something that maybe in the eyes of other, others may have seemed insignificant, but that I was making a difference in the sense that I was helping these young men learn more about who Jesus is. That I was helping them to grow closer to Christ. For me, that assignment wasn't about simply coming into a room and policing a group of boys. It was an opportunity for me to be used by Christ to make a difference in their lives. When, when the, the way you know that ministry fits is because you're not concerned about whether it is a stressful or an easy assignment. All you're focused on is, Jesus, this is an opportunity for you to work through my life. Isaiah 6, verse 8, one of my favorite scriptures. Isaiah, the Bible tells us, in the year the king Uzziah died, verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 6, says he saw the Lord. Isaiah had this incredible experience where he beheld God in all of his glory. And I'm sure that even what he beheld, what he described is but a glimpse of, of, of really what is, right? But Isaiah tried to do his best to describe what he saw, and what he saw was magnificent. And the scripture says that so magnificent was what he saw that all he could utter was, God, I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. He saw his, his sinfulness in comparison with God's purity and holiness, and he recognized, I do not belong. And the scripture says that Isaiah was beside himself, and the Bible tells us that in response, an angel came and took tongues, a uh, flaming coal from a, a fire, and, and, he, and, he, and he used it to touch his lips and declared Isaiah to be cleansed. And then in later verses, the invitation became, Isaiah heard the invitation from the Lord saying, Whom shall we send? Who will go on our behalf? And immediately, we don't get the sense that there was, let me think about this first. Let me see if I can be useful. Isaiah immediately responds. He says, here I am, send me. Isaiah, had, because he had an encounter with Jesus, recognized that what, Christ, what, what God had done in his life was an opportunity now for him to now be, a, be an instrument that God could use him, through which God could work in, in the lives of others. When you and I come into ministry, when you and I serve, when you and I are doing whatever it is that God has called us to, our ministry fit, we are not worried about whether it's an easy assignment. We're not worried about whether people are looking at us. What we are concerned about is I get to be an instrument that he can use. So again, when I said last week, I say again, it doesn't matter what the role or the assignment is. If it is what he has called you to do, you do it with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength. Why? Because you see it as an opportunity for him to use you. So again, when ministry fits, it's when you see every assignment as an invitation for Christ to work in your life. When ministry fits, number two, you rely on Christ to help you accomplish more than you could on your own. Again, there are many roles and assignments that I've had the opportunity to serve in over the years and many times in my life where I thought, I'm not good enough for this. I can't do this. This is not for me. Or this is not what God wants for me to do. And a lot of times it wasn't because I had sought the Lord's face and asked him for direction as to what he wanted me to do. It was really because I was using other metrics to determine whether I was useful to God in this scenario or not. But again, I want to remind you that anything God calls you and I to is not because he wants us to be completely self-reliant in doing what he's asked us to do. Philippians 4.13, we know this scripture very well. I can do all things, Paul says, through. Everybody say through. Some translations, like the one that you see on the screen, says because. Paul says, anything I do that is of significance for the kingdom of God, I am able to do not because I am talented, not because I am gifted, not because I am wise beyond my years, not because I have this incredible ability and there is nobody else that God could have chosen or used for that. He says, I do it because it is Christ who works in me and through me. So one of the ways you know that ministry fits is when you recognize that, God, I'm not in this because I called myself to this. I'm not doing this because it's based on my ability to simply do this. I'm doing this because I'm totally reliant on you to help me to accomplish more than I could accomplish on my own. Every single day, whether you realize it or not, ministry is taking place. Ministry that you see in the, in, you know, when, when you, whenever you're out and about in the, in, throughout our campus, our facilities. But then there's ministry that happens behind the scenes. Ministry that you would never see happen because you're not in the vicinity or the presence of those who are carrying out that ministry. But what I can tell you is this, that every one of those people who are doing what God has called them to do, 
recognizes that it is not their talent or ability that is the determining factor of the success in ministry. It is the one that they've answered, whose call they've answered. That their prayer is, God, I'm doing this. I can do this because you give me strength. So whether you're an usher, you're a greeter, you're a musician, you're behind the computer, you're greeting, you're taking care of children, you're driving a golf cart, or you're, you're helping to clean, or it doesn't matter what it may be, but you're doing it. Why? Because it is Christ who gives you strength. And that becomes the motivation and your passion for why you do it. That's how you know ministry fits. And here's the last point. Ministry fits because we derive satisfaction from knowing that we are advancing Christ's rule in the lives of others. Again, we need to learn to see ministry as more than just a task or an assignment or a chore. We learn to see ministry as advancing Christ's will in somebody's heart and life. We had, when we had our, our staff meeting recently, one of the things I told our staff was the fact that I appreciate what they are doing. Because it was important for them to hear me say those words. Why? Because what they do is what enables a lot of other things to happen. Again, many times we are so concerned about what we see in the forefront that we fail to realize all of the work that happens behind the scenes. And the reality is, is satisfaction, brother and sister, does not come from whether or not I'm noticed. It doesn't come from whether or not somebody acknowledges me for what I'm doing. Satisfaction comes from knowing that what little I am doing is making a difference. It's contributing to what God is doing. Again, when we learn to not see our ministry assignments as simply chores, but then we see it as Christ working through me to accomplish his work, that when, when, I, when, I, when I greet the person at the door with a smile on their face, on my face, not knowing what they may be going through, not knowing what they've stepped away from, but they chose to be in the house of the Lord, that perhaps it could be my words, my, my gesture, my, my embrace, my love, my care, my concern, that becomes the catalyst for, for, for them opening up to the Lord and, and, and allowing the Lord to help them or to meet them in their place and point of need. That when it is that child that is just screaming at the top of their lungs because you know, they just don't want to be here or they want to be with their parents, but you grab that child, you hug that child, you console that child, and you begin to minister to that child, that you are, you are, you are literally the expression of Christ to that child. That it doesn't matter what it is you are doing, that you recognize that it is important because the goal and the purpose of it is to advance Christ's rule in people's hearts and lives. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. He says, so now, my dear brothers and sisters, I want you to stand strong. He says, do not let anything move you, but always give yourself fully. Everybody say fully. In other words, he's saying don't hold back. You know, the term, you know, in in sporting circles, you know, give it 100% or leave 100 on the field. Leave it all on the playing field. In other words, give it your very best. Paul is saying that you and I, as we are working for the Lord, we are to give ourselves fully to his work. Why? Because we know that our work on his behalf is never wasted. It is never in vain. It is, it, it, again, we think because people don't notice us that it's wasted. Or because people, somebody doesn't thank me that it's wasted. No. You're not working for people. You're not working for men. You're not working for me. You are working for the Lord. And he tells us in his word that anything we do on his behalf is never wasted. So my satisfaction comes from knowing that, you know what? What I'm doing is making a difference in helping to advance Christ's rule in people's hearts and lives. We're talking about finding our ministry fit. And I want to share with you something that's very exciting because uh, several years ago, um, there was a a new ministry tool that came out that was introduced to the church and was introduced by Pastor Rip Warren in Saddleback Ministries called the Shape Assessment. And this Shape Assessment went beyond the traditional um, spiritual gifts assessment that we typically take. I've taken a spiritual gifts assessment before. I'm, I'm sure you have as well. But what this specific shape assessment does is it goes beyond just the spiritual gifts, but it identifies that there are different aspects of you and I that defines or helps us to understand what our proper ministry fit is. I want to challenge you this morning. If you have not found your fit in ministry, you have a place. We want to help you find your fit because the responsibility that Christ has given leaders in the church is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. I would not be doing my job if you simply come and I don't challenge you or give you the opportunity to find your ministry fit. If I deprive you of the opportunity for God to use you, to work through your life, to help advance the work of his kingdom. 
And so I'm really excited about this shape assessment because one of the things I want to challenge you today is to actually take a shape assessment if you've never done one before. Whether you found your fit or you are looking for your fit, perhaps maybe you're not sure about what your fit may be, this is one tool that I want to encourage every single person here to take. It's going to require some time, but it's going to be worth it. Because if your goal is to find out what it is, that how God has wired you for ministry, then this is one tool that you do not want to ignore. There's several aspects of this shape assessment I want to quickly share with you that it addresses. I mentioned to you, it talks about a spiritual gift. Every one of us has been blessed with a spiritual gift. There's a question that we all must answer. What has God supernaturally gifted you to do? Every single one of us has a spiritual gift. And perhaps you know it, perhaps you don't, but every one of us has a spiritual gift, and God's desire is that we discover what that spiritual gift is. So this assessment that we want to share with you is going to give you the opportunity to discover what that spiritual gift is. But not only do you learn about your spiritual gifts, but then you also get to address the issue of your heart. And heart deals with the question, what do I have a passion for and love to do? What do I enjoy doing? What do I derive joy and satisfaction from doing? This assessment will help you to identify what are your passions. What are the things that drive you? What are the things that, that sometimes maybe keep you up at night because you're thinking, you're dreaming, you're imagining all of the possibilities of what God could accomplish through you in that area? The A refers to abilities. What natural talents and skills do you have? Uh, do you, are, you, are, you, are you an artist? Are you a person who, who is very gifted when it comes to technical things? Um, are, you, are you a writer? Are you, are you visual? There, there's so many different things. I mean, of course, you know, our abilities are expressed in our careers, right? Our vocations. You know, many of the jobs that we do, that you do, are, they involve your abilities, skills that you've learned over time. What are your abilities? What are your talents and your skills? The P ref represents personality. Where does your personality best suit you to serve? I'll give you a quick illustration. Many years ago, I had an individual come to me and ask about serving with the youth. And I said to them, great, let's sit down, let's talk. And in the course of our conversation, several questions I began to present to this individual. Uh, as, I, as, I was, as I was asking these questions, I could see kind of this quizzical look on their face, kind of like they were wondering, why are you asking me all this? And it was important for, me to, for them, for me to know, this question, to have these questions about their personality answered. Why? Because I wanted them to understand that there is a makeup of you, there, there's, a, there's a part of your personality that, that, that may determine whether you are best suited to work with students or not. And in the course of our conversation, we discovered that working in youth ministry, specifically junior high ministry, was not best suited for his personality because, for one, he was very, very much an introvert. I'm an introvert, but he was to another level. <laughs> the kind of introvert that didn't want to interact with anybody. And I said to him, I said, well, that's not going to work because teenagers need people to engage them. But what was interesting was that we didn't just walk away from that conversation identifying, well, because you're an introvert, this is your personality, that it's not going to work specifically with junior high ministry. But we were able to identify what are other things that he could do that would not force him to have to do what he is not comfortable doing. So when we talk about personality, we're talking about what you are, what, what your personality best, is best, best suits you to do. Are you a team person? Versus a person who works best with by themselves. Um, are, you, are you a person who is task-oriented, right? Where you just want to be given an assignment and you're just going to do 100% of, you're going to give 100% of yourself fully to it. Or are you the kind of person that perhaps maybe you like to be involved in processes and you don't necessarily just want to be given an assignment and just be left to fend for yourself. You want people to walk with you. There are so many things to discover about that. And then the last thing is your experiences. What spiritual experiences, what educational experiences, what ministry experiences, what painful experiences have you had? And, and the whole idea with this shape assessment is this, that it helps you to look at, look at yourself in a, from a holistic perspective, your spiritual gifts, your heart, your abilities, your personality, your experiences, and it helps you to identify how God has wired you for ministry. So that we are not, as it were, taking you as a square hole, square, 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 uh, square peg and trying to force you into a round hole. But that we know you're a square peg. This is how you best fit. And it's a process, brothers and sisters. And, and I, I think for the longest time, there are too many who did not realize how important this process was. But I'm thankful 
for the wisdom that God gives, you know, church leaders to be able to develop tools like this. And so this is something I want to introduce to you. And so here's your assignment. I don't think I've given you an assignment before, yes? My first time? All right, so we're going to have an assignment. We have a spiritual gift assessment that we want you to take. Um, a shape assessment, excuse me, that we want you to take. Um, and for the longest time, we've had this on paper. And you know, I know sometimes dealing with paper can be very cumbersome. But due to the hard work of one of our staff members, Sister Dell, we have been able to get that onto a digital format. So now on your computer, on your phone, on your tablet, you can take this, spirit, this, this shape assessment. And in, bet between, in, in about 30 to 60 minutes, you will be able to discover what, how God has wired you for ministry. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to take out your mobile device. You won't always hear me say this, take out your mobile device, but everybody take out your mobile device if you have one. And I want you to scan that QR code that's on the screen. Those who are watching online, you're going to see the same thing on your screens. Scan that QR code, and it's going to take you to a spiritual, a, I keep saying spiritual gifts, shape assessment. And we ask you to give between 30 and 60 minutes of your time. We suggest that you actually do it at a goal. So don't do it when you know you're going to have other things interrupting your time, because we want you to be able to honestly, objectively answer the questions that you've been asked. And you're going to be excited about the results. Because what, not only is it going to help you to identify how you are wired in the, all of these different areas, but then the goal that we have as a ministry team here at Bracewood is to be able to assess your, uh, or look over your assessment and be able to come to you and say, hey, we, we believe that this is where you are best fitted to serve. We want to make sure that every worshiper at Bracewood finds their ministry fit. And this is one tool that's going to help us make that a reality. So I just want to quickly share that with you. It'll stay on the screen for a few more minutes. But as I conclude this message, I just want to challenge you to consider the following. Once again, that are you allowing Christ to work through your life? Have you found a place or role, a task that he's called you to in which he can work through you? Are you reliant on his power to do through you what you cannot do by yourself? And are you able to find joy in what you're doing? Why? Because you know that what you're doing is contributing to Christ's rule in somebody's heart and life. Every single one of us has a place in what God is doing. And God is inviting us to get involved, to invest ourselves. And I want to, invest, I want to encourage you, get on board. Get out of the sidelines. Get on the field. Get excited about what God wants to do through you. And let's see God do incredible things through his church. Why? Because every one of us has found our fit and we are doing what God has created us and called us and gifted us to do. Amen? I want to invite every head bowed and every eyes closed this morning. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your word. God, over this last several weeks, including today, we have been reminded in the book of 1 Corinthians 12 about the opportunity that you have given us, Lord, to be invested in the work that you are doing. Thank you for reminding us in today's message, Lord, that, Lord, you have wired us a specific way, Father, to do specific tasks that are in keeping, Father God, with the purpose that you have for us as a church. God, I am so grateful that no part of the body is more important than the other. Even though there are parts that are significant in what they contribute, Father, it doesn't mean that any part is more important. And God, I am grateful that, Lord, every worshiper here, here at Brazewood is an important part of this local church. God, my prayer for them today is that, Lord, you would help them to find their fit in ministry. Lord, for those who are serving currently and are invo involved and invested in ministry, God, thank you for their labor of love. Thank you, Father, for their service, for your kingdom. Thank you for the difference that they are making that is bringing glory to you. But, Lord, for those who have not found their fit yet, God, I thank you that, Lord, starting today, I believe that, God, they will be on a journey, God, of discovering what their fit is so that, Lord, they too can be invested in what you are doing. God, I'm grateful, Father, for your faithfulness in all of our lives. And God, I pray that you're going to inspire us, Lord, and to stir in our hearts, Lord, a desire to be used by you, to serve you, to bring glory to you with everything we do. And so, God, I just want to say thank you. 
Thank you for the discoveries that will be made over the next day and week, Father, as your people, Father, especially utilizing this tool. Discover how you have wired them for ministry. Thank you for the wisdom that you would give us as a leadership team, God, to be able to help your people, Father, find their proper fit and to help them to flourish in the place to which you've called them to serve. And God, again, as your people, Father, are faithful to do what you've set on their hearts to do, God, thank you that, God, you're going to use them to accomplish great and powerful things for your glory. And that, Lord, together, Lord, we will continue, Lord, to live up to the purpose and plan that you have for us as a church. God, we give you glory and we give you praise. And we thank you, Father, for your faithfulness in our hearts and our lives. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and everyone said, Amen. So again, I gave you homework. Please don't be mad at me. I assure you, this is one homework you're going to enjoy. I do want to share with you some quick announcements before we conclude today's service. And again, I thank you all for being here this morning. I want to remind you that the church app is available for you to utilize as far as staying, on, staying in the know with events and activities coming up. We have online Bible studies that meet um, on Sundays, on Tuesdays, uh, throughout the course of the week. I want to encourage you to utilize the app to help connect with those events. I wanted to announce that we have our next membership class scheduled for Sunday, July the 14th at 8.30 a.m. It's going to be in room 206 in the auxiliary building. If you're not a member of, of this church, I want to encourage you to become a member. Some people ask the question, well, Pastor John, why do I need to become a member? Isn't attending okay? Uh, I would say to you that there are responsibilities, there are opportunities that are associated with membership. We have a duty as a church, as a, as a membership, as a body, to uh, make decisions and choices that, that help us to, as a body, move in the direction of God's will and calling for us as a congregation. I thank God for the pastors, for our executive board that you have elected to serve in office and to help lead. But you also have a part to play. And in decision making, in uh, electing leadership, in serving some, some several roles within the body, we encourage you to be a member. In fact, you have to be a member to fulfill those roles. Uh, but but more, than, more than anything, I would say the memberships, membership is one way of affirming that you are committed to a local assembly. Membership, member, by becoming a member, you're saying, I am committed to what God wants to do in this local church. And I'm not going to simply invest my resources, my time. I'm going to invest my energies as a, as a voting member of this congregation. So again, I want to encourage you to be a part of our, to join our membership class. Pastor Bruce, our executive pastor, leads this class. Um, and it'll be on the 14th of July. If you will go by the activity center to sign up, we'll be able to get you ready for that. Again, remind you, Mega Sports Camp is... July the 15th through the 18th. This is an event we put together at our Branch Forest campus. And so again, parents, if you have children ages 5 to 5th grade, please sign them up for this great event. We have a cap of 85 kids that we are going to be accommodating for this year's camp. So please do not procrastinate. Sign up as soon as possible. And if you'd like to help us volunteer with, for this event, we encourage you to sign up as well. And I want to invite you to join with me in doing something. Every Wednesday night before we have our service, we have a group that come together online to pray for about an hour. We call this the Hour of Power, um, and it is on Zoom, even though we also have opportunity to have you join with us in person in the prayer chapel and be a part of this prayer meeting. Uh, but I would encourage you to join us on Wednesday nights to pray. We usually have a list of prayer requests that we pray over, and we just cry out to God together as a, as a group. And I would encourage you, if you have not been a part of one, to join us this Wednesday night. And it's going to be very easy to do so. Uh, again, either you join with us in person in the prayer chapel at 6 o'clock, or... Um, you're able to join us online. We pray on the Zoom video conferencing app. And the way you can uh, access that meeting is by using the church app. And it'll take you right to that meeting. But again, I want to encourage everyone, as many of us as possible. There's no limit to how many can join online. So again, as many as possible can join us to pray with us. Uh, we would invite you to be a part of that. And then this Wednesday, and we don't have the slide for you on the screen, but this Wednesday night, uh, we have our teenagers, our, our youth, our junior high and high school students who will be uh, presenting their different uh, creative arts, uh, you know, drama, dance, spoken word, sermons. Uh, several of our students, I believe about 40 plus, are going to be heading to Columbus, Ohio in, June, in August for National Fine Arts. They've been invited to compete at the national competition. And so we're going to get to uh, receive from them this coming Wednesday. So I would encourage you uh, to make plans to be a part of Wednesday night service. It's going to be a great opportunity for our young people to minister to us and to encourage us and to bless us through their gifts and talents. And, and I know that your presence will be a such encouragement to the young people. 
as they continue to pursue God's plan and calling on their lives. Amen. I want to invite everyone to go ahead and stand as we conclude in the word of benediction. And again, to all of our fathers, our father figures, happy Father's Day. And I pray that you have a great, great day. Enjoy yourselves this day. Again, I mentioned earlier, we have a gift we'd like to present to you just as a way of our appreciation for you and as a, a token of our um, gratitude for what God is doing in your lives and through your lives. And so on your way out, um, the ushers will be distributing those. Please take, take one uh, before you leave this, this morning. I want to invite you to lift up your hands toward heaven. Um, and at this time, I would invite all of our altar ministry assignment, uh, altar ministry workers to please make their way to the front. Uh, if you have a prayer need this, this morning before you go, we'd love to pray with you, agree with you, for God to meet you in your place and point of need. Um, lift up your hands with me toward heaven as we conclude in a word of benediction. Father in heaven, we are grateful for your word, and the opportunity, Lord, that you've given us, Lord, to spend time in your presence. God, I declare over your people today, reminding them that, Lord, they are disciples of Christ, that, God, we walk today with the assurance that our past is redeemed, our present makes sense, and our future is secure. God, we covet, Father, your power to walk by faith, live by prayer, to labor by your power, and to live for your glory. God, I declare to your people today that no matter what obstacles will come their way, that they will count on your faithful guidance, that, God, they will depend on your grace to overcome any circumstance. God, I declare they will not be bought, compromised, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. Your people will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. They will not hesitate in the adversary's presence. They will not negotiate at the enemy's table. But they will instead be strengthened through prayer and equipped by your, for your divine purpose. And should our Savior return for a church or call us home to our eternal rest, God, we declare, Father God, knowing with certainty in our hearts that, God, your banner of love is over us. And because of that, Father God, we know that you have no problem recognizing us. God, we declare, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fruit of the Holy Spirit be with us and abide with us now and always. But we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. God